Today is uh, June 15 of 2005. Uh, it's a beautiful morning here in Salt Lake. Uh, it's uh, cool for this time of year. Uh, and it's my great honor to, uh, to interview uh, uh, Judge David Sam of the United States District Court for the District of Utah. Uh, Judge Sam was appointed to the federal bench by President Reagan in 1985. He was confirmed by the Senate in that same year. Uh, he has continued to serve as a federal judge uh, for the past 20 years. In 1999, Judge Sam went to senior status and has, has been uh, very active as a senior uh, judge in this district, handling some of the most important cases uh, in this district. Um, I've got to tell you, Judge Sam, that it's a great honor for me to uh, interview you. Uh, I've, I've appeared in front of you a lot, and uh, every lawyer who appears in, in front of Judge Sam uh, knows that uh, he or she will get a fair shake, will be treated courteously and with respect, and it's always a pleasure to be in your courtroom. Well, thank you, Alan. It's just an honor for me to, to have the privilege of being with you here today, and I, I just want you to know what great respect I also have for you, and I, I well remember a very significant case that you tried in my court uh, that went on for, I don't know, I think it was six weeks or something yeah. like that, the Merker Mine case, and uh, what a significant case that was. Yeah. Judge Sam, I want to ask you to begin our, our interview with a question about uh, the bees. Oh, yes. Now, you have a beehive in your courtroom. It's just over your right shoulder there. Maybe you can just tell us about it. Probably. I'm not sure, but I think I'm the only federal judge in the federal judiciary that has a working glass hive in my chambers. And I'm just uh, very happy to have them here because I, I'm a hobbyist beekeeper. And my father got me my first beehive or two beehives when I was about uh, 10 or 11 years of age and where I was raised in northern Indiana. And I've had bees off and on during my life uh, ever since that time when I could have them. And uh, when uh, the thought came of uh, bring them here, the GSA, uh, they were very excited about uh, helping uh, arrange the window so we could put them in the window. And, uh, and they've been a very... Uh, important part of my furnishings here. Uh, in fact, here in the courthouse, excuse the pun, I, I think they've created quite a buzz. In fact, people who, uh, who uh, come to see me, I, I think they'd rather see the bees than, than see me, and I, it's always a pleasure to tell them a, a bit about them. Well, let me ask you this question. What is it about bees that interests you? Well, they're just... And what do you uh, learn from bees? You know? Well, they're just one of the most fascinating uh, part of creation and all of creation. In fact, uh, with my deep feelings about uh, uh, spiritual things, I, I've often said to people that uh, they are truly the footprint of uh, deity. They're just, uh, they just have so many things about them that are just unbelievable as far as uh, their, uh, their knowledge of how to do their work and uh, how they're uh, focused in on this particular hive, uh, and uh, it's just a fascinating uh, study uh, entomo in entomology. Uh, in fact, bees have nationalities like uh, we human beings. Uh, I've had uh, most of my bees are Italians, uh, and they're just a little feisty like Italians. Uh, these bees here are Carnolians, and uh, so they're a different nationality after having the Olympic uh, trial that I, I had, I thought of uh, my four or five beehives in the backyard that maybe I ought to put a little flag on them and get a Russian, uh, a a Russian hive, and, uh, and I've, I've often said to counsel, uh, you know, that maybe I ought to get an African uh, hive here because they're the most feisty of all bees, and if, uh, if I had them here in chambers, and uh, if you can see on that glass hive, it has a back door, and if I put counsel in here and say, now we've got an hour to get this case uh, settled, and if we don't get it settled, we'll open that back door and see what <laughs> happens. <laughs> but uh, no, they're just, uh, 
they are just absolutely fascinating and it's just uh, remarkable how many of their traits are very uh, very human they have uh, their own language uh, and the language of a honeybee you might uh, be interested in knowing is is universal whether they're african uh, italian carnolians uh, caucasians uh, uh, the foragers that go out and gather their their honey or nectar when they come in and communicate that to the other foragers uh, the language of the Italian, the African, the Russian, the Caucasian, the Carnolian is all the same. It's, in other words, if a Carnolian came into an Italian hive and, and went through its little dance uh, on distance and direction, uh, they would understand that. And so there, I sometimes say when I'm lecturing on bees, uh, uh, the Tower of Babel did not affect uh, uh, the honeybee like it affected uh, the humans. Uh, but uh, the other thing about them is that uh, they're very human in the fall when the honey flow stops uh, they uh, when they have no nectar they send out little bands of robber bees and so uh, to rob their neighbors <laughs> and so yeah, that's uh, one of the one of the frailties of uh, of their personality and so I sometimes say the fall of Adam uh, did affect the honey bee but uh, the Tower of Babel did not so anyway <laughs>
And uh, that's so, why I love the naturalization <laughs> setting and these new citizens, and many of them have similar stories that uh, uh, in their history and their experience are very similar to my mom and dad. Are there any particular stories of, of naturalization, uh, people in naturalization hearings that you can recall? Oh yes, there's one that I stands out and I sometimes like to refer to it when I conduct a ceremony and uh, it, he was a, a, a gentleman from Africa, I believe it was uh, from uh, one of the countries there, Ghana I believe it was, and uh, when I conduct the ceremony, uh, during the course of the ceremony I, I let uh, one of my, uh, uh, Michelle Royball, take a portable mic among the citizens and uh, have a representative of different parts of the world uh, to say a few words of what this day means to them. And I remember when he got up to express uh, his heartfelt appreciation of being a, a citizen, he, he said, uh, you know, that if he, and without any disrespect to any other country, he said, if I became a citizen of, of Germany, he said, I, I would always be uh, uh, an African or uh, from Ghana, I would never be regarded as a German. Or if I was in Russia and became a citizen of Russia, I would never be uh, regarded as a Russian. I would always be an African or from Ghana. But he said today, and with great emotion, he said, I am an American. And I thought that was a very significant, very moving, and. Uh, and everyone was very touched mm. by that. <clears throat> Let's talk a bit about your, your growing up. You, you grew up in northern Indiana. Northern Indiana, right. In, in Gary? Well, it was Hobart where I was born. And uh, Hobart is uh, just a real nice community there in northern Indiana, about nine miles from Gary. Tell us a bit about your family. Well, I'm the youngest of uh, nine children. My mom and dad, all of our, my brothers and sisters were born here. And uh, nine boys and two girls. Ten of us uh, grew to adulthood. One of my mother's children, uh, one of my brothers, uh, passed away at uh, two weeks, but the rest of us were privileged to grow to maturity and I uh, just had a very enjoyable boyhood. My uh, mother, uh, however, passed away when I was four and so I never did really get to know my mother except through my older uh, brothers and sisters and my father. My father never remarried. Uh, I am told that uh, or was told that uh, the language of our home was Romanian because my mother never spoke uh, English and so I spoke uh, Romanian and English until I was four and at that time my father uh, never after she passed away he never uh, spoke uh, the language anymore in the home and so I missed out on growing up in a bilingual home which I of course uh, regret because later on in my career uh, I was privileged to be assigned to uh, with five other American judges to go to Romania and uh, but anyway, it was a wonderful boyhood, and, and uh, my father and mother, they were linguists, although they did not have a lot of formal education. They spoke fluent Hungarian and some of the other languages of that uh, area. There was a great German influence in the area where they were born, Transylvania, uh, and, uh, and so... Now, now the, the name Sam... Tell us about the origin. Oh, the name, yes. Uh, my father's name was not Sam. It was uh, Andre Serb, S-I-R-B, Andre Serb. And my mother's name was Flora Toma. And when he went through the naturalization process, uh, I don't have the exact detail of how that all happened, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, the name S-I-R-B. It was a short uh, surname. Uh, but on the naturalization papers, uh, his name uh, Andre, Andre was Andrew, and uh, it came back uh, Andrew Sam, and my father always liked the name Sam. In fact, uh, I also remember growing up uh, him uh, saying on a number of occasions how fortunate we are to not only be citizens of this, the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but to bear, he said, and he would say it with a 
emphasis, the great American name of, of Sam, hmm. like Uncle Sam. And so when I grew up uh, during the war years, I was eight when the war started, uh, uh, you know, and I would see these posters, uh, I Need You by Uncle Sam. I thought, boy, how lucky I am. <laughs> There's my uncle, <laughs> you know, and Senator Hatch uh, mentions that also on the Senate floor. You know, uh, during, right at the end of the Olympic bribery trial, uh, there was an article about you in the Associated Press. It was syndicated around the country, and one of the quotations from that article is uh, this, Judge Sam appears to be profoundly influenced by his family's hardships in fleeing Romania in 1914 and their pursuit of freedom. Uh, has that heritage affected your judicial philosophy, the way you approach cases? Well, I think it has in this respect, and that is that uh, I think it, it is significant that that uh, on my professional lamp back there, the angel of justice or the angel of justice and mercy, uh, she ha she's blindfolded, as you know, and she holds a scale of, uh, of justice in her one hand and a sword in the other and uh, I think that blindfold uh, has great significance to me in that uh, I've always felt it uh, imperative that whoever appears before me no matter what their color no matter how they look no matter what their s station in life uh, that they be treated uh, with respect and with dignity and uh, and equally and so I believe in that respect uh, it it has mm -hmm. and uh, coming from uh, peasant humble beginnings uh, I just uh, feel that uh, every human being is uh, is I important and I believe the founders understood that when they when they laid the foundation of this country and uh, drafted the great that great document, the Constitution of the United States, and that means a great deal to me. Tell us uh, how you came to Utah. Well, I, I uh, <coughs> actually joined the LDS Church when I was 18 back in Indiana, and I was attending uh, Valparaiso University, which is a Lutheran college and a very highly respected and regarded college uh, near my home. I had a scholarship there. Uh, I am rather short, maybe you wouldn't believe this, but I had a scholarship for basketball, <laughs> <laughs> for basketball, and uh, I guess now they're more the, the point guard type. Uh, we didn't have the three-point shot then, but I, you know, I, I don't want to embellish my abilities in any way, but uh, I, I could shoot good from the outside. <laughs> and so I had a, a scholarship there, and uh, that's when I joined the LDS Church. And like many, uh, I wanted to come to BYU and uh, pursue the rest of my education at the Y. And so I came to the Y and uh, finished. Uh, I was in the ROTC program and uh, went on an LDS mission when I was uh, between my junior and senior years and uh, served a two-year mission and, uh, and then came back and, and married and uh, finished my degree there and on to the University of Utah, College of Law. I was also in the ROTC programs I mentioned and commissioned uh, at uh, Greenville Air Force Base. In fact, I think I have a picture back there by the Beehive uh, the base, the air base where I was commissioned as second lieutenant. Hmm. And I was in the flight program, uh, and I, at the time they needed uh, legal and medical officers, and I was, they had a program to apply if you qualified to be deferred to go to law school, and I did, and I was accepted and, uh, and uh, deferred on a six month basis because they needed uh, flying officers, and so I had to turn in my grades every six months, not knowing, you know, uh, however they were reviewed, whether I would get another six-month deferment. So all through law school, six months to six months, I didn't know whether I was still in law school or I would be in flight school. That, would, that was a good inducement to... It was a good inducement to try, <laughs> to try to keep my grades up. <laughs> and then I, I graduated uh, 
they called it the Air University out of Wright Patterson. They didn't have the uh, springs. They Air didn't Force Academy. Air Force Academy. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and so it was uh, administered out of Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And uh, after you graduated, you still had to to be a legal officer. You had to be a member of a bar, state bar. And uh, so I got another six month deferment to take the bar. And <coughs> if I hadn't passed the bar, I would be in, been in flight school. So I didn't know even then whether I was going to be uh, a JAG uh, Judge Advocate General Officer or a flying officer. Although I loved to fly, and uh, and I passed the bar, and uh, my orders came. I think uh, I think I passed the bar in October of uh, 1960, and my orders. Uh, I received my orders. I had to notify Wright Patterson that I had passed the bar. <coughs> and uh, my orders came, I think, in a matter of two or three weeks, and I was uh, signed Norton Air Force Base, San Bernardino, activated. What kind of work did you do there? I was in the JAG office, the Judge Advocate General office. It was a base very similar to Hill Air Force Base. They had a large uh, civilian contingency there, and in our office, we had uh, one wing of our office was civilian civil service attorneys, and in the other wing was uh, military attorneys, and we handled. Uh, the court martial matters, uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Although we did mingle with the uh, civil service attorneys and the contract review attorneys, and sometimes we, we did a little bit of that, although I didn't do too much of that. Mine was almost exclusively uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice. Hmm. Meaning and what? What kinds of cases? Well, court martial, uh, it was just the criminal code of the Air Force, the military, which is very similar to, the, to our criminal code, and uh, handled uh, a lot of uh, different types of uh, cases. Probably a good way to get your feet wet. And a good way to get my feet wet, yes. I appeared before court martial boards and, and uh, both as uh, prosecutor and defense counsel because we'd be assigned mm -hmm. as prosecution, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the prosecutor in one case, and defense counsel in another case. So it was a great experience. And then uh, you, you and your family returned to Utah. And I returned to Utah That's to, well, <clears throat> my dear friend Jim Smedley, who I was in law school with. In fact, we were also in the mission field together and then in law school together. And he was county attorney, I believe, in Wasatch County at the time. Told me that the, he thought a great place to start would be uh, in a rural area and Duchesne, uh, it was a county seat, and there was no attorneys that lived there. They, they were all in uh, Roosevelt or Vernal. And, uh, <coughs> and he said he would visit with the city council uh, and see if they might consider appointing me the city attorney. And uh, as I was closing my military career, uh, I did receive a call from Lauren Allred, who was the city clerk. And uh, he said that the city council had met, uh, that uh, Jim Smedley had presented my name to them and they had voted to appoint me a city attorney of Duchesne City and I, I was just, I'd never been there. Well I think I had been there to going back and forth to Indiana mm -hmm. but uh, I you know I could not remember Duchesne and of course after I got there I, I thought well maybe this is the reason I, <laughs> I couldn't remember it. It was such a small place but uh, Alan I was so thrilled when I, uh, I got off the phone uh, and said to my wife I said this is the greatest honor that could possibly ever happen in my whole professional career to uh, be appointed a city attorney of a of a city in, in Utah and I and I was so thrilled and I you know when he Lauren was telling me about the you know the arrangement I it, it really didn't matter to me it was just the privilege of being a city attorney and the arrangement was that they were going to pay me uh, five dollars a month a retainer and uh, of course, when I think of that uh, in retrospect, uh, you know what a what an insignificant amount. But again, that wasn't the thing that really meant uh, anything to me. It was the privilege of serving as a city attorney. And then they were going to pay me. I think it was ten or twelve dollars uh, an hour for uh, the work that I actually was going to do for the city, which it turned out to be not you know that much. 
And again, that didn't really matter to me. It was just the privilege of, of serving and uh, being so, a city so attorney. So you were able to have both a private practice there? Yes, and, I, and I was. And city attorney. That's correct. And there was a story that I, you've told me before about your housing. Oh, the housing, yes. And I, we didn't have a home. We lived, uh, in fact, when we went through law school, you know, my wife and I, we, we just get, went through law school on a wing and a prayer. I worked uh, uh, for the uh, Frost Top. Uh, they had some drive-ins, and I serviced the Frost Top uh, drive-ins. And I, the, my last year, I got a, a job with the post office in this building. As a matter of fact, little did I know that in some future years I'd have this beautiful, uh, these beautiful chambers, but I, you know, tossed mail downstairs. They were so good to me. They let me first drive the little trucks around to pick up the mail around town in the boxes. And then they assigned me to a business uh, district on 2nd uh, West and about uh, 10th, 12th South. There was a bunch of businesses through there, and I carried that in the morning. And then Stadium Village in, in the afternoon with, where the students were, and they were in kind of a barracks, uh, as you may, uh, you probably don't remember that, but, but anyway, it was just a bunch of barracks, and, uh, and I delivered that in the afternoon, and, they, and it was just wonderful. And I, in fact, uh, Joe Anderson was just out here, formerly a, a judge with the juvenile court and former U.S. attorney, and reminded me that uh, uh, Don, uh, uh, <laughs> and the last name slips my mind, but he was uh, a senior carrier next to me, and he would help me and show me how to throw the mail because uh, he, the senior uh, mail carriers, they delivered mail downtown, and those were the elite uh, routes, you know, to, to carry mail, and, uh, and he was just so wonderful. Uh, we lived, uh, after getting out of law school, we, we got our first home on Marshall Boulevard in San Bernardino. It was just a cute little house on a palm studded street and uh, and we just loved it there uh, my wife and I and and then on the phone I made arrangements uh, Lauren already put me in touch with several people to uh, rent a house sight unseen and <laughs> and anyway when we got to Duchesne uh, and the well we came from the south through uh, Mexican hat and up that way uh, Price and then over Indian Canyon. When we got to the top of Indian Canyon, the road, uh, the pavement stopped and it became gravel coming down on, on uh, the Duchesne side. And I thought, my goodness, I didn't know they had, you know, gravel road all those, uh, and I think it was about 30 miles from the top down into Duchesne. And uh, anyway, when we got to Duchesne, it, it was just such a small little community. And then we drove around to find the house and we found it, and it was really quite a kind of a run-down place. I, I was just a little bit <coughs> taken by the looks of the place. But anyway, the, the van, we stayed, at, I believe it was in a motel that night, and the moving van came uh, and the next day and unloaded. And we had uh, two children born at the Air Force Hospital. Uh, I had two children, we had two children born in law school, so we had four children. And my wife had little Tammy, uh, about six months, uh, babe in arms. And boxes, of course, piled around. Our first furniture that we ever owned in our life, we bought uh, while we were in the Air Force. And um, I looked at her between the boxes, and I, I know tears were trickling down my cheeks, and I, I said to her, Honey, what in the world have I gotten us into? And that was my beginning of Duchesne, and it was uh, just an hour or two later, the sheriff... Uh, pulled up uh, with his wife to greet us and uh, George Merritt. In fact, I just spoke at his funeral just a few months ago. One of my dear, dear, great friends. Uh, but he gave me a little counsel. I'll never forget the counsel. In fact, I, I mentioned this at his funeral. He, he asked me, uh, among other things, as we talked, he asked me if I had been to finishing school. And I, I was puzzled and I said, finishing school. I said, I've been to, I graduated from BYU and I graduated from the University of Utah, but uh, he said, but have you been to uh, finishing school? And I, again, puzzled. I, I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know what you mean. And he said, well, he said, we have some great, uh, wonderful lawyers here in our county, uh, the residents there at uh, Roosevelt. And he said, uh, but 
my my if I have any qualms about uh, the work that they're doing, uh, he said they they start a case, but never seem to finish it. He said if you will tend to business and start your cases and get them finished with uh, dispatch and uh, in a professional way, he says you're going to have all the work that you can ever imagine having. And I'll tell you that was just wonderful counsel and I, I've done my best. I don't know how well I did but uh, I just had a wonderful, from those beginnings, uh, I just had a wonderful 14 and a half years. And now you, you, ran, you, you were, became county attorney when that yes, was an I, elected position. I was elected county attorney, and five and a half and elected a second term. And then you were elected as a county commissioner. I just, I ran for county commissioner two year term and I was elected county commissioner also. Oh. So I had the experience in the prosecution end uh, and with the city and I represented uh, Eldemont, Tabiona, some of their city affairs also, I represented them and it was just, and I just grew to so love the like people. To, to live and work as a lawyer in a, in a small rural community. It was, it was just wonderful and the children, they just, they loved it and I, I just, I don't know, my wife loved the, the rural setting also and sometimes, you know, I think wives may may tend to like the, the, the lights and the, the shopping, but she loved the rural area as well. And I, I know that, and also I think George uh, mentioned this to me, uh, you know, if you, if you love the people, uh, they will love, love you. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we, we sure had that fulfilled. And it was out there, you know, in my vainness, Alan, I, I must admit uh, that I thought, gosh, who will ever see me out here if I raise my hand out in this little rural area, who will ever see me, you know, out here? In fact, some of my friends would say, oh, David, what are you, what are you doing in Little Duchesne? And, uh, you know, it was there that uh, Governor Rampton appointed me to the uh, Board of Water Resources, which is one of the very distinguished uh, state boards that uh, travel around the state and, and handle the water projects uh, that are going on. And uh, it was there that uh, he appointed me a uh, Democratic governor to the state bench, 4th Judicial District. So you didn't have to do much raising of your hand? No, really. I, it just, as George said, if I attended the business and I, mm -hmm. and I had, you know, the banks, I had a lot of uh, title work, uh, probates. Uh, it was just a wonderful variety. Uh, Indian law. Y you know, I sometimes think that lawyers uh, today get slotted too narrowly in an area of practice and don't have the opportunity that you had and to a certain degree I had to do a bit of everything when, when, they're, when they're young lawyers. Right, I agree with that. And I no, think I that that may affect their ability to have judgment, to, to, to grow in, in judgment as time goes on. Uh, I've often, when I talk to law students, that don't overlook the opportunities in the rural setting because uh, number one, in the rural setting often you're needed and I don't know any greater fulfillment to a lawyer than to know that you are needed and, and, uh, and wanted and, uh, and often in the bigger city setting uh, you just don't have that uh, kind of uh, fulfillment. Now, I understand that during this period of time you had the, when you were practicing in Duchesne, you had the opportunity to appear in the federal court here. Well, I remember, well, no, I appeared uh, also before Alden Anderson and uh, Sherman Christensen, but the, the one, uh, this, I don't know, I hope I'm saying, don't say this in a, any disrespect, but uh, the, the ones that I remember the most, uh, I appeared twice before Willis Ritter. And I can remember uh, with great detail those two appearances. Tell us about that. And, and I don't know that you can say that uh, about, uh, you know, every judge that you appear before the very, and of course, Sherm, you know, I just loved. And, and, uh, uh, and they, they, they were just great judges in Alden. I, I just loved, he was just a great judge. 
But uh, my first appearance, uh, I was with uh, in, the shir- uh, in uh, Ritter's Court on the second floor, where the Chief Judge uh, D. Benson is now. And I was sitting in the back of the courtroom, and it was very crowded. His, uh, I understand his dockets were, I mean, he just had uh, full dockets, lawyers uh, summoned to be there on yeah, short note. And I was uh, by this very nice lady that I was representing from Roosevelt, and she had been charged with uh, embezzlement of funds at the uh, First Security Bank. And I was just kind of going through my file with her sitting next to me, and, and, and I heard a bang. <clears throat> and I looked up, and, I, and his face kind of was red, and he had this big white uh, head of hair, and uh, he was uh, kind of yelling at, uh, it was William Thurman, Bill Thurman, he was the uh, U.S. attorney at the time. But anyway, uh, he kind of was yelling at him to get down that hall and get that file and quit wasting the, the court's time. He had a jury sitting there, and apparently they were taking a verdict or something. And, uh, and and Bill was very respectful and said, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, uh, I forgot to bring this file with me. And, uh, and he was just giving him, a, you know, just a, really giving it to him. And, and, I, and I was kind of asking the, the lawyer next to me, well, what, what had happened? And he said, well, he had asked the, the judge to, uh, if he could retrieve this file that he forgot to, to bring with him. And I'll tell you, it just kind of startled me so bad that I, I, by the time it was my turn to appear before him, I, uh, I was pretty uh, nervous about appearing before this judge. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember uh, the, the lady that I had, she, she was just a sweet lady, and it was just a very unfortunate fact situation. But I remember how kind he was to her. And uh, it, the, the colloquy that went on between the U.S. attorney and, and me and her, it was, uh, what, what is she charged with? Something like that. And, and uh, embezzlement, uh, Your Honor. And, uh, well, how much? Uh, and, of course, it, the indictment just had the, you know, $50, I think, mm-hmm. then, to make it a, a felony. And it was considerably more than that. And I remember him uh, uh, saying to her, uh, are, are you married? In a very fatherly way. And, sh- and of course, she's sobbing, uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, how many children? Uh, and I think she had like about five or six children and sobbing. And, and then he turned to the U.S. attorney and said, big deal. Bring this poor little lady in here and embarrass her for $50 embezzlement. When you've got uh, all these criminals running up and down the street of Salt Lake, why don't you get after those people? And I thought he was going to get after me and say, well, what are you pleading her guilty for? You know? And I was, I was just startled. And, uh, and he, but he was so kind to her, but so uh, uh, rough with the uh, U.S. attorney. And then the next time I appeared, I was just uh, sitting at council table with George Merritt, this wonderful sheriff from Duchesne County who was uh, being sued for false arrest. Uh, and it was uh, just a terrible uh, false identity type uh, thing uh, uh, where he had arrested uh, uh, this person on a warrant uh, uh, that uh, wasn't the right person and uh, and I and George wanted me to sit with the attorney who was representing the insurance company and I remember when he was uh, during the course of the trial he would often comment to the jury which I I've uh, you know felt uh, judge that comment. judge Ritter would say well isn't this an awful thing that's happened to this this poor man and then as he would be reading the instructions to the jury he would make comments about isn't this uh, isn't this an awful case and I thought my goodness what is the verdict going to be in this in this case and I remember saying to counsel uh, you know uh, boy this is going to be a terrible verdict and he said well you know he wasn't sure because sometimes that you know offends the jury and and he said that uh, and if it is, uh, we'll just take it to the Tenth Circuit because uh, Judge Ritter was often reversed, as we know, at the Tenth Circuit level. And although he was, uh, you know, a brilliant, brilliant man, and uh, and the jury verdict I remember was, I think, three thousand dollars, which we were just so thrilled and relieved <laughs> that uh, it was a very nominal amount.
1976, you were appointed to the state bench in the fourth district court uh, in um, by by Governor Rampton. How did it come about that? How did your appointment come about? Well, that was the commission process also in the state system. I believe then they had uh, seven members and the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was the chairman of the commission. And there were three of us that were uh, sent to the governor, uh, Ron Stanger, uh, Cullen uh, Christensen, Sherm's uh, brother, and my name. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like, again, uh, what a blessing to, to be appointed to, to the uh, state bench by uh, a uh, Democratic governor because I had run on the Republican, Republican ticket for county attorney uh, and for county commissioner. Mm. Although I wasn't really, you know, real active in, the, in political affairs, I, I was somewhat active uh, and, uh, and my wife was uh, somewhat active in. So you moved from Duchesne to, to Provo? No, I, at first uh, I, I was out in the basin uh, for one year. There was some talk. So the basin is, is, is within the fourth district? Yes, it was uh, Uena County, uh, right. Duchesne County, Daggett County, uh, uh, Utah County, uh, and, Wasatch. and Wasatch County. And let's see, the county south of uh, where Fillmore, uh, that was uh, uh, Millard, County. Millard County, right. Millard County was in the fourth district right. as well. And I was uh, out in the basin for a year, and, and one of my uh, fellow 4th District judges, in fact, uh, Alan Sorensen said, uh, David, uh, you know, after coming aboard, uh, he indicated we'd sure like to keep you, you know, but of course, uh, state judges were, had to go through the electorate, as you, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then, uh, you know, it was not, uh, the process now is, is different. Uh, then it was, uh, you know, you were on the ticket. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, wasn't the retention type uh, uh, program that they have now. Uh, and he said, you know, being out there in Duchesne, uh, he said, you know, we have prominent lawyers in, in, uh, in Utah County that would very much probably like to be a, a state judge. And, uh, and he saw my position as being quite vulnerable. And he said, uh, my advice to you is, uh, you know, to, to move in. And so uh, there was talk, though, at the time of making that a separate district out there like it, it is now. But uh, apparently it was not going to happen. And so we decided to, uh, we first moved to Heber, and then we moved from Heber into, uh, into Springville. And we've been at Springville for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, you had to face the electorate the, the next election after being appointed. And I was not opposed, and I was relieved that... Uh, I wasn't opposed in the next election and then the following election because I was on the state bench nine years. From 1976 through 1985, yeah. T tell us uh, about your colleagues on the, on the fourth district. Oh, I just love my colleagues. Uh, Judge Bullock, uh, Judge Balaf, uh, Judge uh, Sorensen, and, uh, and myself. Mm -hmm. yeah, we just had a great, uh, great relationship. And, and uh, did you travel from... from County rode the county. rode the circuit uh, on on rotation, and uh, we just we just had a great great relationship, and uh, and it was my privilege uh, after serving you know so many years, then uh, being becoming the presiding judge, and uh, I got to preside over state uh, judicial uh, conference uh, in uh, in Ogden, and. Uh, and it was just a, just a great experience. Interesting cases. Right? Interesting cases, yes. Uh, I remember one, though, that came, comes to mind before I became uh, a judge. Uh, I went down to... Uh, Blanding to try a case against Alec Joseph, uh, the notorious. Well, he was kind of a, you know, I, I don't know if you remember him, but he was, I shouldn't say notorious, he was, he was in the press all the time because he was the famous polygamist mm -hmm. that had, I think, 12 wives. And one was a lawyer, one was a nurse, one was, I mean, he had wives for every kind of business thing that he was involved in. 
And I remember in the, in the news, uh, I, I represented Green and Weed out of Phoenix, and they had a lot of properties uh, around the state and down in southern Utah particularly. And they had a lot of properties out in the basin, and, uh, and he had uh, defaulted on a payment, uh, or several payments, on properties uh, down by Glen Canyon down there. And he, and he was in uh, the National Enquirer, uh, you know, if any lawyer comes down here, tries to, you know, evict me, uh, they're going to, you know, have a bullet right between their, their eyes or something. You know, he, he made just terrible comments, you know, to the press. And I was a little nervous about going down there, uh, you know, to try the case because it was coming up for trial before Don Tibbs. It was a bench trial. And uh, uh, Dan, uh, I think it's Dan Weed, was it? Uh, Green Weed, uh, they own Wahweep, the, the uh, you know, the Wahweep um, marina down there. <coughs> and uh, so they put, uh, and Jim Smedley, I, w I was concerned about going down by myself, so I got Jim to go with me. And <laughs> And we stayed there. They put us up at Wahweep, and it was just beautiful, you know. And, and uh, Dan said, well, let's go out to uh, his uh, ranch and see if we can see uh, Alex. And I said, gee, I don't know if I want to see him. I'll see him in court. Uh, I don't know that I want to see him on his property. He said, oh, no. He said, he's just really a fun guy. He said, we'll just go out and see him. And, uh, and at the time, uh, he owned a restaurant, I don't know, El Brazo or something down there. And... Uh, so on our way out, he said, well, let's stop at the restaurant because some of his wives uh, work at the restaurant. And we'll just go in like we're, you know, tourists, and we just ask questions about, uh, you know, how things. And so we went in and had a piece of pie, and, and gee, they were just lovely ladies. <laughs> and, uh, and we asked them about, you know, the lifestyle, and boy, they were just like missionaries, you know. They were just going to convert us to, uh, you know, the polygamy way of life. And... Uh, and so we just had a nice visit with them and then, and then out to the, uh, where the ranch was. And uh, in the distance, he had a D9 cat or something. I, he said, well, there he is way over there uh, on the cat. And he will whistle and, and uh, call him over. And I said, well, gee, Dan, I, you know, he'll just flatten this truck right to the, gr <laughs> the ground if he knows I'm with you. You know, maybe you have a good relationship. <laughs> but anyways, he, he just said, oh, no, you'll, you'll enjoy him. But anyway, he came over and lifted up the big uh, uh, bucket on the front and he, he headed over to us and hopped off. He had one of his wives on the on the cat and she was a lovely lady too. And uh, she heavy equipment operator? I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> she was there with him. Maybe she might have been one of the wives that operated heavy equipment. I don't know. But he had a kind of a band. You know, I, he was uh, half Indian or, uh, or three quarters Indian, I believe. And he had kind of a band around his head and uh, and a uh, very charming personality. I mean, I was just, uh, he was friendly and warm and uh, we talked about, uh, you know, the proceeding uh, tomorrow. as well, we'll see you in court and my, my lawyer wife will be representing me. And so we uh, appeared in court the next day and it was, uh, you know, it was really, the case wasn't complicated because it was pretty uh, much a slam dunk fact situation tried before Don Tibbs and often he would uh, come over to my table and say uh, you know he talk to me and say what do you think I should uh, do and I said well I think you should talk <laughs> talk to your lawyer you know and, and see what you should should do and uh, but you know of course Don Don just ruled from the bench uh, that you know the uh, awarding the property back to uh, my client uh, for default and and I think what happened later I think he then caught up the payments and I found out and, uh, and Dan let him, Dan Weed let him have the property. But we had a nice visit afterwards and I think at the time he had absconded with some helicopter. You know, he's a helicopter pilot too. He had all kinds of uh, talents and uh, the, the U.S. Attorney was uh, bringing some kind of an action against him for that uh, also. So that was all in the news about the same time. So that was kind of an interesting, yeah, interesting case. case. Yes. Let me, uh, let's talk about your service, uh, your appointment as a federal judge in 1985. Uh, you were appointed by, uh, by President Reagan. That's correct. And uh, what was the judicial selection process like? Well, that was the commission process also. And at that time, I think there was uh, 19 
uh, members of the of the commission or the committee, and uh, uh, we met here. Uh, they they met. Uh, I think it was on Second South. There was a bank there at the time uh, on the corner, and it was February the 25th, uh, 1985, uh, when I was called to come in to inter be interviewed with a number of others, very distinguished individuals from uh, our area here, and uh, of course I was quite nervous about that, and uh, uh, Jim Sawoya, Judge Sawoya was the chairman of the commission. And uh, uh, Oscar McConkie, I remember he was on mm -hmm. in the circle there, and several others that I, I recognized. I remember when Judge Sawoya came out to get me, I you know I was told him I was quite nervous, and he said, "Oh, David, don't don't be nervous. You'll you'll do you'll do fine." And they sat me at the end of the table, and it was uh, quite a process. And the thing that was so interesting about that, Alan, was as my wife and I drove in, I said, uh, you know, this is quite a significant day. Not only that I'm being interviewed by this wonder, wonderful distinguished commission, but it's my mother and father's birthday. And I felt kind of a special, special feeling. And, uh, and for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, during that interview and the questions that were asked by various people of me, uh, I just felt uh, just sort of a warm, a warm feeling, and uh, and after it was over, I came out. Uh, my wife was waiting for me, and I said, I just really felt a, just a special feeling in there. And uh, and I learned, I think it was the next day that I was uh, one of five. They submitted five names to the president, and that I was one of five. And I also understand that they ranked the names. And again, I don't know that this. Uh, Again, I don't want to embellish my situation, but I understand that uh, they felt very good about my, uh, uh, my... You were number one. And I was the number one on the list that went to the president. And I never felt that I could possibly be number one. And, uh, and then, of course, Senator Hatch uh, was very pleased to uh, be the support of my nomination and uh, and then of course we had to go through a lot of interviews back in Washington I'd never been to Washington before now did you know Senator Hatch had you had a role well yes I did uh, in fact the press often said you know they kind of uh, uh, oh this weekly out here uh, often would make the comment that you know because of my uh, missionary relationship with that we were missionary companions well, we were never really, we were not missionary companions. We were in the mission home together uh, here. Uh, he went to, uh, from Pittsburgh to uh, the Great Lakes Mission, which was Indiana. I think Fort Wayne, Indiana was the headquarters of the Great Lake Mission. So he was going from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I was going from northern Indiana to Minneapolis. And he was a tall, thin elder in a bunk. I think he was next to me in the mission home here. That's just when we were there about six days. And I remember we both lamenting about uh, being shortchanged, about uh, wanting to go to some far off exotic place, and here we were going next door to our our homes, and uh, and then I was uh, homesick, and <laughs> he was trying to, you know, make me uh, feel uh, good about going on my mission I, because I I don't know I was probably the most homesick missionary the LDS Church ever had in their history. <laughs> and my dad used to call me the baby of the family. It used to embarrass me, you know, when I was growing up. But I, I, I was really uh, homesick uh, about going on my mission after I went. I wanted to go real bad, but then I got terribly homesick. But anyway, we, we got on the train, and then we parted company, I think, at Des Moines, Iowa. His went on to Indiana and mine to Minneapolis, and that was the extent of our missionary experience. But... Uh, the press has often said, you know, the reason I was appointed to the bench is because, you know, he and I were, or they inferred on sometimes, not the press, and t I don't know, I'm probably not saying that right, but anyway, the, the comment uh, about my being his missionary companion. But you had a lot of supporters, not just Senator Hatch, you had a lot of supporters. Well, Bill Nixon, I come to find out that he, you know, he was an assistant U.S. attorney, mm -hmm. that he was on that commission also, and... Uh, and he actually was Senator Hatch's missionary companion. 
And I said, they got you and me mixed up, Bill. <laughs> they, they put me in your shoes. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, anyway, the FBI, they were, you know, it was interesting because I, at my church there in Springville, they, a couple of the people there said, you know who I saw on the sidewalk? A couple of, you know, well-dressed uh, men, and they pointed at that house and said, do you know who lives there? And they were FBI agents walking around the community and out in the basin and, and different people that I hadn't heard from for years would say, do you know who called on me? A couple of FBI agents. And then I had a couple of FBI agents uh, who apparently headed the investigation come into my chambers uh, downstairs and you know, tell me what a pleasure it was to to meet the people that I knew from my past, you know, and so it was a real treat. And then you received a phone call. From oh yes, President I'll Ray never forget that. that call. Okay. That was uh, no, uh, August 1st, 19, 1985. I was in my chambers in Provo. I was conducting a pretrial. I think Bob Moody, Ron Stanger, Brian Harrison uh, were sitting across my desk. A knock on the door. The door was closed. It's Katie Harris, who was the switchboard operator. And she was very excited. And she said, uh, uh, invited her to come in. She said, Judge Sam, uh, the White House is calling. She said, I've turned my switchboard over to my backup. She said, would you mind if I came in and w was privileged to be here when that call came in? And I said, oh, fine, Katie, come in. And then the attorneys uh, politely, uh, they were going to leave, but said, well, Judge, can we stay while when the call comes in? And I said, oh, sure. And then I had some attorneys waiting out in the waiting area for Six another one. and and they came to the door and and, and I, my chambers in Pro was much smaller than my chambers here and we were all crowded in there and my phone was behind the desk and the phone rang and I picked up the phone and said hello and it was a woman's voice and she said uh, hello she said uh, the White House is calling for Judge David Sam and I said this is he speaking and she said uh, one moment please for the President of the United States. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, it, was, it was President Reagan, truly, uh, you know, when we hear these comments about him being the great communicator and warm and friendly, he, it was just like talking to, to you. Uh, I remember the kind, it was very short, I remember it very well. He said, hello, Judge Sam. I said, hello, Mr. President. He said, I'm calling from the Oval Office this morning to tell you that I have a document on my desk uh, which when I sign uh, will appoint you a United States District Judge subject to the advice and consent of the United States Senate. He said, I'm calling to ask if you will accept my presidential appointment. And I said, well, Mr. President, I said, I am deeply humbled and honored uh, to uh, have you call and, and uh, personally, and, and I very humbly and gratefully uh, accept. And he said, well, thank you, Judge Sam. And then he said this, which I've, I've never forgotten, because it was such a personal thing. He said, would, would you please express to your wife and children my love and my appreciation for their support of you in, in uh, this uh, uh, great uh, appointment, uh, presidential appointment. And I said, indeed, Mr. President, I will. And I know they would want me to express to you, and I join with them in expressing to you our love and our prayers and our faith in your behalf and in behalf of Mrs. Reagan, uh, our great First Lady. And he said, thank you, Judge Sam. And that was the end of the conversation. Nice thing to remember. And uh, what a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful thing. And then, of course, the, the scary experience of then going before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which, of course, you don't hear very much about regarding the U.S. District Judges, although there's a lot of 
publicity going on right now, but uh, uh, that was uh, quite a scary thing for me to... What was that like? Well, it was, uh, it was in their hearing room, and the, if you've been back there, well, you probably have, their, their, uh, the bench is like a half moon. And I think they have, what, 18 or, I mean, there's just, there's just quite a, an array of, of senators, and, uh, and uh, Senator Strom Thurmond was the chairman uh, when I appeared before them. And we flew back to Washington, and we appeared first, uh, we were, we had three appointments, one at uh, uh, Senator Hatch's office, one at the Justice Department's office, one at the uh, investigator for the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, all in the morning, and uh, I think my hearing was at two in the afternoon. And uh, the first one, uh, D. Benson, and uh, uh, and his uh, associate uh, there interviewed me, and kind of went over things, telling me maybe what to expect, uh, what questions might be asked, and. Uh, don't worry, uh, David, uh, or Judge David, you're, everything uh, looks fine. Uh, your files are in great shape. Um, but there is one uh, senator, uh, Senator Paul Simon from Illinois, the one that wears the big the bow, tie. bow tie. You'll recognize him with the big bow tie. And he's going to probably ask you some very pointed questions, not in any way uh, getting at you, but to let the president know that He's watching these assignments very carefully, and so uh, just be a little bit, uh, you know, alert to that. And and they kind of reviewed uh, some things with me uh, on judicial activism, and you know, some of these sure. things that uh, uh, that they talk about a lot in the in the news. And so from there, uh, I you know, I didn't think much about it at the time. I went to the Justice Department. The lady attorney. Uh, interviewed me there and said, uh, you know, everything, Judge Sam, looks fine. Your files are in great shape. But there is one person on that committee that I'm just going to alert you to, and that's uh, Senator Paul Simon from Illinois, the one with the big uh, bow tie. And I, you know, about then I started to, you know, think about, boy, this guy is pretty, you know, kind of mean. And uh, she said, don't, you know, he's not uh, going to be about you personally. It's just, he's just going to try to maybe throw a few curves at you. and. Uh, by then, I was just starting to get a little nervous about this Paul Simon. And then, uh, just before noon, uh, by the, in, uh, the special investigator of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, and he had all of his files on his desk. And uh, again, uh, Judge, uh, everything looks great. He said, you should have no trouble with the committee. He said, but let me just tell you, there's just one guy on that committee that uh, likes to give uh, candidates a kind of a going over, and that's uh, Senator from Illinois, Paul Simon, the one with the big bow tie. And by then, I'll tell you, I was pretty shell-shocked. I mean, I was just re getting nervous about that. In fact, uh, my hearing was at 2, and, and my wife and I, w I brought Tammy and Danny, my two children, with me on that trip, two of our children. And uh, we went outside, and I said, boy, I don't know. I don't think I can go to lunch. My stomach is just churning. and. Uh, so we sat around the, the mall area there waiting until about 1.30 and then we went over to where the hearing room was and they started to gather and gosh, they had all kinds of mics on the, the desk and TV cameras all over and I wasn't the only one up uh, for hearing, but I think some of our local channels were there. I think KSL, I think uh, Channel 2 and, and, uh, and Senator Bennett came in and Senator Hatch uh, Senator Bennett sat on my left, I think, and Senator Hatch on my right at the table. They made some real, well, actually, before we started, uh, Senator Strom Thurmond came in and Senator Hatch introduced me to him, and he was very kind, sweet man. He commented on how nice-looking my wife was and my children, how much better-looking they were than me, and I said, well, that's right. They kids they take after their mother, <laughs> thank goodness. And uh, anyway, uh, when we started, uh, Senator Bennett made some real kind introductory remarks uh, and said he asked to be excused to go to the Senate floor for some important business. Then Senator Hatch made some, oh, and my name was called first, by the way. I think there were three of us up for uh, confirmation hearings. And, uh, and then Senator Hatch made some kind introductory remarks and then took his place uh, up uh, on the committee.
committee with the committee. And then Senator uh, Thurman, uh, Strom Thurman, opened uh, the session, greeting everyone, and uh, and then said, uh, Judge Sam, we uh, welcome you, and we now have some uh, questions that we wish uh, to ask. And uh, then I kind of looked around the table, and here was the big bow tie, and uh, this is the way it started. Senator Simon said, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to uh, ask if to have the floor. And I thought, oh my golly, it's starting right with him, you know. And this is what he said. He said, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, he said, uh, my staff and I have reviewed the credentials of the three individuals that we are considering for confirmation today, and we find them uh, qualified. And he said, I have important business on the Senate floor that I wish to respectfully request to be excused for. And I thought, boy, what a, what a great. And then he, uh, he kind of stood up and said, uh, Judge Sam and the others, he said, uh, uh, congratulations to you. I uh, wish you well in your tenure and your important assignments. And after that, it was just uh, leading questions. I mean, I was just uh, like, uh, Judge Sam, uh, you, 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 you don't believe that you should be, uh, you should let the legislature, uh, the congressmen and uh, senators and the congressmen uh, make the law and you, uh, you not make the law. You just, uh, and I said, no, I, I agree. I, I don't think judges should uh, make the law that, you know, they should uh, enforce the law and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, although I think there are times, of course, I've found that, uh, you know, maybe there are times when judges do have to maybe make more of a stand on, on things. But uh, it was just a very uh, pleasant experience. No problems. No problems. And, uh, and, and I went out and I was so thrilled uh, with that. I think BYU was playing Temple University. I didn't have tickets. And I called back to BYU to see if there's any chance to get tickets and we're going to stay an extra night or two because I was <laughs> thrilled with the way things went. So, <laughs> so we went and rented a car, and my wife and I and, uh, and two children, we got to, and Lavelle Edwards had tickets for us at the will call, and uh, we... So the Senate, the Senate Democrats didn't have to filibuster? No, they didn't. <laughs> it was nothing like you're hearing today. Although then, there were, there were a couple of judges then, I remember. It seemed like there was one from back east that they were kind of on. And then on the wall there is the the Senate vote, uh, and I believe it was, you know, I was such an insignificant guy, you know, from Duchesne, Utah, and hadn't authored any, you know, scholarly articles uh, that they could pick apart, uh, and I, I think the vote was just, uh, you know, they probably didn't know me from anywhere. What, what do you think about what's been happening recently? Just even over the past two administrations, you know, it takes yeah, years I, for some boy, judges to get Yeah, boy, I just, confirmed. I just feel bad for, for these people that I know they're just brilliant, outstanding candidates for service in our country. But I, I think they've made a, made it too political, in my, my humble opinion. Now, I understand, I, I believe I remember you telling me once that uh, shortly after you were appointed from the bench, you had a conversation with Sherman Christensen. Oh, yes. Uh, not long after I took the bench, uh, he invited me to come over to his chambers, uh, which was in the Wallace Bennett building. And uh, he welcomed me warmly and said, David, how, how pleased he was that uh, I had the privilege of serving with these great, wonderful judges, and uh, he said, "David, I there's something I, I would like you to have." <laughs> I was so touched by that. He went behind his desk. It was uh, the great seal of the United States, and he took it off the wall and said, "David, this is the seal that was given to me when I was appointed to the United States District Court. I think it was in 1954." Mm -hmm and uh, I've got a little thing on the back of it, and it had the few chips in it, and he kind of gave me a warm little fatherly lecture on, 
on the privilege of uh, serving and that we were not masters of uh, the people that appear before us. We, we are their, their humble servants and, uh, and what a privilege to serve uh, in a country where the founders established uh, the Constitution of the United States that protected uh, individual individuals from the oppression of tyranny and, and uh, how, how wonderful it was to be the guardian protector of these, uh, these rights with which he felt were, were inspired uh, by the, the founders were, were inspired mm. by the powers of heaven to, to lay the foundation of this great country. And I was so touched, I said, Your Honor, I, I am just overwhelmed. And I said, I just hope and pray that I can in some small way, uh, you know, honor this office and honor you by the service that I, I perform. And then when, uh, you know, they made me a court here, they didn't have a court for me here. Uh, I, I, I had temporary quarters over in the Wallace Bennett building. And then Alden Anderson, Judge Anderson was so gracious when they finished his, he said, well, David, you, you, you occupy. I said, no, I, I'm fine. He said, oh, he insisted that I occupy his. Now you, you took Judge Anderson's place on the bench. Yes, he, I, he, I, he, he, he I succeeded. He, he went senior status and then I, yeah. and he often reminded me of that. He said, no. And I, and I said, I, I feel very humbled about that and I just hope and that I, you know, bring honor to you because I, I know what a great judge you are and were, but uh, <laughs> we, we just had a, a great time. But anyway, th when they did my court suite down on the first floor, the uh, interior decorator, <coughs> uh, he was so impressed with that seal that, you know, it had these mark, uh, chips in it. He said, let me do this for you. He said, let me uh, repair that seal. And I think he had done work in the ho old Hotel Utah and maybe in the, I think the, in the Salt Lake Temple, but he said, I have some gold leafing. He said, I, I want to put on it and the circle there is gold leafing and I think the eagle head is gold leafing and the arrow heads are gold leafing and I think the stars and maybe the leaf uh, on the olive leaf, I think, uh, are gold leafing too. But it, it just looks like brand new. And so uh, what a privilege to have that in my chambers and remind me of this great judge. And then to have the privilege when he got, you know, Sherm was, he was active right up in, into his 90s. In fact, I remember catching up with him down the hall. He was robed up and uh, <coughs> downstairs and he was heading for the courtroom on that end. And uh, I caught up with him and I said, Your Honor, I said, uh, are you hearing a case today? And he said, yes, David. And then he made this comment. He says, you know, David, some cases never go away. <laughs> and, uh, but then, you know, when he finally was put in a uh, kind of a rest home in Provo, you know, it was my privilege to, on my way home, I would often stop his, he had it fixed up real nice and an easy chair and we'd I, I just have the highest regard for Judge Christensen. I tried uh, <coughs> uh, a case that went on for quite a, a while, and uh, uh, like you, he he brought. Uh, he was such a gentleman, and, oh, and he was gentleman. so courteous to everybody, and right. he made it fun to be in the courtroom. And yes. he had a great sense of humor, and oh, he treated yes. jurors with a lot of good humor. And right, he was he, great. He was wonderful. I, I just my great example and mentor, you know. You've you've served for uh, a number of years here with with some other judges who uh, oh, are yes. favorites of mine, Judge Jenkins oh, and Judge, Judge Green Jenkins. and Judge Jenkins. I love Linder Judge. Oh, I love them all. They're just, I mean, they are just wonderful. Uh, tell us about your your relationship with Judge Jenkins. Yes, uh, you know, when I first came on the bench, I, I was treated just. Uh, I don't remember ever being treated badly in the press in Provo. Uh, on the fourth district court and when I came on the bench uh, one of the first things that uh, 
that happened, uh, U.S. probation, there was a number of sentences, uh, drug cases that, uh, you know, the disparity was, was great, uh, a lot of disparity between the sentences. I guess that's the, uh, you know, the, what is being the attempt in the last 20 years is to make sentences more with the sentencing guidelines, uh, with the sentencing guidelines yeah. and the sentencing commission to make the sentences more uh, around the country, uh, uh, you know, more, more uniform. More uniform. Mm -hmm. And uh, so <coughs> the uh, uh, they presented me with uh, some uh, some of these cases, and so then uh, you were able to just do it by court order. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I adjusted some of the sentences uh, uh, to make them more uniform. And I don't know whether it was the next day or the day after, boy, was I ever bombarded in the press by uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney. I don't know if I should mention names, who is, uh, you know, a great friend. But uh, he just really took me to task on on that and how I was just uh, upsetting the whole sentencing procedure and and I was just shocked and uh, uh, you know my wife we she was a great comfort to me <laughs> and uh, anyway I, I didn't know what to do with my colleagues and Judge Jenkins was the chief judge he was out of town at the time uh, but when he came back I, I just had to go to the chief judge and uh, tell him I, I just hoped I hadn't brought in discredit upon this great bench. And I sat down in his, uh, on the second floor, and he, <laughs> this was a great moment. He uh, leaned back in his chair and kind of put his hands through his, his uh, head of hair, his kind of musical voice. He said, uh, well, David, why should you be treated any different from the rest of us? Or why should you be different from the rest of us? Maybe it was the reverse of that. Maybe it was, why should you be any different from the rest of us? Or why should you be treated any different than the rest of us? You know, that was the greatest thing that someone could it's an perspective, isn't it? put everything at, like, welcome mm -hmm. to the federal bench. And uh, to those of us who have been through the war and the experience. And I said, thank you, Judge Jenkins. That's great. And I just went back and, and from then on just uh, did my, what uh, I knew I should do and uh, whatever would be would be. And I, of course, I've, I learned, you know, why, why are we appointed for life? Why are federal judges appointed for life? And it's been made very clear to me that uh, we are an independent judiciary and we are not to be influenced by the press, by the president, by the senator, by the governor, by the signs on the street, that we are to do what we know in our heart and mind is right according to the facts and law and you are good. You're, you're a believer, as am I, in the importance of the principle of judicial independence. Absolutely. And the uh, powers beyond my own, you know, that uh, I believe we're entitled to, to have if we live uh, for that, that uh, come to our assistance. And I believe that that is the case. And that's why we are such a great country. one of the great experiences, maybe you're coming to that, uh, in my judicial career, I'm sometimes asked what, what is probably the one thing that stands out uh, as uh, above any case maybe that I've handled. But in 1991, Alan, I was called by the, Senate, uh, by the uh, State Department to go to Romania with a delegation of American judges, six of us to assist that country in their transition from communism to democracy. And what a privilege to go to Romania, the land of my, my father and mother. And, uh, 
and the only one that has ever gone back to Romania from our family after their incredible journey and experience of coming to this country. And to go there uh, at their request, not requesting me, but requesting our government to send uh, a delegation to assist them after the fall of uh, uh, the Iron Curtain and Nikolai and Alina Ceausescu, their, their horrible reign of terror over Romania for the years that they uh, were there. And as you know, they were tried by a military court on December the 25th, 1989, and an hour's proceeding and taken out and executed, summarily executed, both of them. Now you talk about swift justice, but uh, what a relief it was for them to throw off that yoke of, uh, of terror that uh, existed in their, in their country. And then to go there and to have them treat us like, like royalty, uh, although their, you know, their facilities were very substandard compared to ours uh, after going through what they've gone through. But uh, What kind of things did you talk about with them? Well, with we them talked about them? putting in place a constitution similar to ours. We talked about putting in place a jury trial, about to putting in place a a uh, defense bar that uh, was on equal status with uh, the prosecution uh, and to put in a system that that patterned ours to give people uh, agency the freedom of choice uh, the bill a bill of rights uh, which they've they've never never had they they talked about their system of justice they talked about telephone justice they had a facade of a judicial system uh, where they could show the world, uh, you know, that they were fair and uh, uh, just like uh, Alan Francis Powers, I think, the U-2 pilot when he was shot down over Russia and they put on the trial, you know, to show how, what a great uh, system they had. But uh, they said the communists weren't interested in, in every case, uh, but those cases that they were interested in, the telephone would ring. And you were directed on how this case is to be handled and how it's to be disposed of. Now, what kind of justice is that? It's no justice, and they knew that. And uh, and the secretary or the securitate, the secret police, uh, the phones all bugged and wired. Uh, my goodness, uh, you you just uh, you know you just a knock on the door meant uh, possibility of uh, fear and terror and someone being taken, never to be seen again. And so they were so that, uh, you know, uh, the dawn of a new day had finally come when they could maybe put in place a system. And they told us about, you know, the B-24 and B-17 raids over Ploest, Ploesti, and how the Romanian un underground, how they risked their lives to get the American air crews that successfully bailed out, and some of those, those uh, bomb runs were disasters and uh, how the, you know, the Gestapo executed and terrorized them. And, uh, and so they've lived, uh, and they, these stories, they said, someday had to be told to the American people of uh, the hero, heroism of the Romanian underground and, and, and uh, the hope that they had that someday the Americans would come save them from their awful. Now, now, after you had your experience with this judicial conference, you had a chance to visit the Yes, the home hometown of my parents. I, I, my wife and I were worried, how are we going to get to Pelu? Because it's over by the Hungarian border, and they had our itinerary, just very tight-knit itinerary for us. And uh, the last stop that we made on our itinerary, uh, after going through Cluj, uh, Poyona Brasov, uh, Bucharest, uh, Sanaya, uh, Cebu, uh, Sigiswara, which is the home of Count Dracula, and I've got some mementos back here, uh, Count Dracula's home, and how they, uh, at, at these big banquets that they, we would have, uh, how they told us how upset they were with us uh, Americans with a little smile on our face, <laughs> how we've made a vampire out of one of their great military heroes of the 14th century, Vlad Tepes, and how when we get back to the United States, we got to tell the people about this great military hero of theirs uh, uh, and that he was not a vampire. <laughs> and, uh, and so we had, and we ate in his home, by the way. We ate in Count Dracula of Lad Tepe's home, which is a restaurant in Sigiswara. But at Sebu, at another big banquet, uh, a very distinguished member of the Romanian legal community pulled his chair between my wife and I and said, I've been assigned. Uh, take you and your wife tomorrow morning, pick you up at 8 o'clock, drive you to, 
to uh, Beldu, <laughs> which was 150 miles from Cebu about. And he said, I have a three hour, three hour uh, window and if we can find someone in that three hours, I have to be back tomorrow night and then you have to fly back to Bucharest, be separated from the group. And uh, Julianne Johnson from the embassy, uh, she was from Mississippi, a young lady, really a sweet lady, who had a sweet southern accent, and spoke a little room, spoke Romanian quite well with a little accent, southern accent. <laughs> and uh, she said the State Department did not want me uh, by myself uh, with my wife in some remote area of Romania. And she said, I've been, uh, I volunteered to go with you. Uh, they wanted someone to be with you. And she said, I have a video camera. And if we find someone, uh, we'll record that for your posterity. And so we left, and I, you know, I have this old photograph that I, I have one back here that's better, but I have this old photograph that I carry of my mom and dad uh, here, oh, yeah. taken in 1917. This is my oldest brother, John. All of us were born here. And you can see how tiny my mom is. She's standing by my father and isn't any taller than he, and he's seated. And uh, this was taken three years after they arrived. But anyway, I told him a bit about the, the story of my parents, and uh, we visited on the way to Bellu. And he said, well, we'll go either to the Romanian Orthodox Church, which is the dominant church in Romania, or to the city building, one or both places, and see if they recognize anything. And we went to the city building first. We stopped on the outskirts, and here was a sign, Bellu. <laughs> So I know it's there, and uh, it's probably a village of maybe four or five thousand, maybe uh, somewhere in that. Uh, you know, they 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 live in these villages, and then they farm out. Their, their land farming is outside of the village, and they come in, and their little barnyards are behind each home. And uh, anyway, uh, as he was talking uh, in Romanian to the uh, to the fellow, and I believe he was the mayor. And he looked at the picture and the story, and he, said he knew exactly where we wanted to go. In a matter of minutes, we were on the doorstep of my, my first cousin, my father's youngest brother's son. And he was in the fields. Uh, it was August 27th, 1991. And uh, the peasant ladies, and there were some men up and down the street coming with their hands, uh, you know, that a miracle has happened. Relatives have come from America and tears coming out of their eyes and they said to my wife and I you be at ease that uh, your your relative will be here soon and then one of the neighbors uh, next door neighbor he was so excited he brought out a little shoe box with pictures in it and he was very excited as he was going through those pictures and he pulled out a picture of my mother and my brother John taken in 1929 oh and I have that photo in at home Mm. And so that is a photo that had been sent by my father to, to Romania, Romania in 1929. Oh. And it's my brother John and my mom and our family cow, uh, our Jersey cow. And my father had written in, on the back in Romanian. And on mine at home, it's Romanian and English. And it says, this is my sweetheart with my oldest son, John, with our family cow. And my father embellishes a little bit. He says, which we use to mow the lawn and who gives like uh, 29 quarts of milk a day. I can't <laughs> believe that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and when he pulled that out, I said, well, how did you get that picture? And he said, uh, because I immediately recognized it. And he said, well, your father and my father were boy boyhood friends. And I also have a picture of that. Uh, and so I took out oh this picture goodness. out of my wallet. This is my father when he was about 16. And he took his finger and he said, there's my, in Romanian, tata, which mm -hmm. is father. And he said, uh, they were boyhood friends and your father sent that to my father in 1929 and he's had that picture passed down to him all of those years. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, with tears in his eyes, he said, you are at the home place you be at ease. Your relative or your cousin will be here shortly. And when they brought him in, Alan, it was, I mean, I've never really experienced emotion quite like that. He just took me in his arms and, you know, didn't just cry. He wept and wailed and, 
and kissed me on the forehead and on the cheek and on my eyes and 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 I just my strength was just I mean it was just zapped it was just uh, I mean it was in tears uh, everyone around there and uh, and you know when it when it settled down I was so weak but I said where was my my father born and he pointed at the ground we were by his door and he said you are standing on the home site he said my home the the old Serb home no longer stands but your father uh, and my father were born on this site mm. and my home was built on the foundation of the old and your was born of us. and I said to him then through the interpreter where was Flora my mom Flora Toma born and he said in Romanian vis-a-vis -vis strada which is face to face across the street and he said uh, the old Toma home was not built on the street and I remember my dad saying there was a little trail up to the my mom's home and, and he said it was off the street and they took us back. There was an old apple tree there and they picked a couple of apples for my wife and I and they said this is the site of the old Toma home. And one thing I learned after coming home from Romania from my, one of my older, oldest brothers, he said the, the, the story that he grew up with is grandma or grandpa Toma and grandpa Serb, the midwives were in the homes uh, delivering my mom and dad. And when they were born, Gram Grandpa Toma came out of his home to tell Grandpa Serb about the birth of Flora, and Grandpa Serb came out of his home to tell, to tell Grandpa Toma. And they met in the street, my brother Ted said, and they rejoiced mm -hmm. over the birth of little Flora, <laughs> little Andre. Oh, great story. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, that's, that's a miracle to me. I, they were born uh, almost uh, the same time. And then to have the experience of growing up as childhood playmates, sweethearts, and then my father, you know, incredibly able to, without visas or passports, to get into Germany. He was trying to get into the seaport, Hamburg. And then to be befriended by a German uh, officer, a man of some means, and being treated gruffly, uh, because my father must have looked pretty ragged. And the war, on the eve of the war, and my father said when he interrogated him, he was, he was, you know, my father said he was rough and mean, and, and he, he uh, my father said there was no way I could trick this very intelligent man, and he took the money out of his collar and out of his boot and just poured out his heart to him. And he said a change came over him. From being gruff, he said uh, he wanted my father to shine his boots, and act like a janitor and my father said can you believe this the miracle that he got clothes for my father and dressed in his uniform and they were not near Hal Hamburg he took my father on a train to Hamburg like father and son and took him to the I German INS people the doctors and got his visas and passports and wished him Godspeed in his eye. we don't have the name of this somehow some way I now finally have the picture of the ship that my father, in fact, it's ironic, isn't it? it makes me embarrassed that in telling and presiding over these naturalization ceremonies, one of the INS agents goes to his computer, comes to my chambers with my father's citizenship documents, and then an FBI agent, his wife, uh, quite a genealogist, hearing the story, uh, does the research. I get on my computer, I can't find anything from Ellis Island. My father came through Pittsburgh. My mother through Ellis Island. Comes in with a bunch of documents. Uh, the FBI agent. The FBI agent and brought uh, the photo of my mother, the steerage list. My mother and grandmother who came with her and they were in the steerage part, you know, that's down in the bottom of the boat. And my father on this one stacker, I remember my father saying this boat that he was on, it was a German crew and uh, it was just a one stacker and he uh, came through Philadelphia, and, and uh, but to imagine those people bringing me, and here I, and I, I can't find anything. And there, some people are good at that. Kind some of thing. people are good at that, <laughs> but what a what a treat, you know. I to ask you, Judge Sam, about uh, what is probably the most famous case that you presided over, 
the Olympic bribery case. Yeah, the bribery case, which was uh, very highly publicized. And again, I'm not a public person. I, I kind of dreaded uh, being in the press, but uh, you know that's part of the territory. Yeah. And now, now this case was tried in in late 2003. Right. And uh, it involved the prosecution of Tom Welch and Dave Johnson. Dave Johnson, for right. Bribery. Right. T tell us a little bit about the facts of the case and how it, how it all unfolded. Well, it was uh, you know they were charged with uh, with bribery and uh, uh, you know using uh, criminal conduct in uh, getting the the Olympics here to uh, to Utah and uh, and you know it was just. Uh, it was just very highly publicized, and uh, the the uh, prosecutors were out of Washington. Uh, Richard Wiedis and uh, John Scott, uh, two fine gentlemen, uh, very very zealous in their their pros prosecution, and uh, uh, you know there was just a lot of interesting aspects to well, that. What case. surprised you about the case? Well, the thing that surprised me about the case was uh, during the trial, you know, they had a list of 43, uh, 44 witnesses. They only called, I think, 13, and this in my prosecution, prosecution, yeah. and uh, they had, I think, 43 or 44 witnesses that they read off at the beginning of the trial, and I think they called 13 or 14 witnesses, and every witness, I believe, I, I mean, every witness, if you could have listened to them, were defense witnesses. Uh, and especially uh, Spence Eccles was just, uh, I mean, he, it, was just, it was just almost uh, outrageous to think that these two people were put through the ringer like they were uh, for five or I don't know how many years. I mean, their family and, and everything, and, and to have a, a case put on with uh, such... Uh, not a scintilla of, uh, of uh, criminal uh, conduct on, on their part. Now, there may have been, you know, some ethical things involved, which, uh, you know, it was brought out. I don't know all of the facts of the history of the Olympics, but it, it sounds like they were doing exactly what had been done uh, for many years uh, before in the Olympic in movement, Olymp in Olympic movement and uh, they were given the charge to get the Olympics to Utah and apparently determined that the only way they could do it was to follow the pattern that was done in, in other, in other uh, cities. Now, I'm, I'm reading again from a newspaper article that, uh, that reports your decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just for those viewers who, who don't know, you, you uh, dismissed the case at the end of the It's a Rule 29 motion, yes. Presentation. Uh, and you, you said from the bench on that day, according to the newspaper article, uh, and I quote, several times during the history of this case, I have heard counsel for the United States represent themselves as the protectors of our moral values here in the state of Utah uh, and protectors of the sacred standards of the Olympic Charter. How commendable and noteworthy. But when considered in light of the government's evidence in this case, how misplaced. Absolutely. What, what lessons should we learn from the Olympic bribery case? Well, I think as a prosecutor that, you know, it's kind of a two-edged sword that we should not, uh, you know, we should not bring a case unless it's, there is really sound basis to, to bring a case because you can destroy the, the reputation and the honor of, of, a, of a person. And, and it seemed to me that uh, it was just an over, overreaching. I, my colleague down the hall here, Judge Green, has, a, I don't know if it's still in his chambers, but he has a painting, I believe, uh, and I may not be exactly correct on this, but I know I was very impressed with it, of this oppressed citizen, uh, just uh, wretched looking, crawling up the stairs of the United States courthouse and all of these power groups, the INS, the, the government, uh, reaching out to, to grab him and, uh, and apparently just uh, throw him to the wolves. And uh, standing there is a, a robed individual on the steps, uh, says United States District Judge. And Judge Green, in his great uh, way uh, and uh, with his great wit, he 
I remember him saying to me, David, you know who that is standing there to protect this, this oppressed person? That's uh, J. Thomas Green, United States <laughs> District <laughs> Judge. And you know, I, I've always been impressed with that, that uh, you know, this is our role. I think we are the last protector of, uh, of you and I and, and everyone else in this country from the oppression of, uh, of overreaching power and authority and how that's got to be kept in check and if it's not kept in check, uh, we, we are going to lose uh, the great freedoms uh, that we enjoy. And when people criticize the, the defense bar, uh, like Ron Yangich and uh, other great defense lawyers who stand up for the oppressed, I'll tell you, if we didn't have a defense bar, uh, we'd be a police state. And if we were a police state, who knows where that would end up at? It would end up like Nazism, and communism, and the Gestapo, and the secret police, and all of that kind of stuff. And so these are things that uh, I hope lessons are learned from from cases like this. And what an honor for me to to you know uh, be privileged to preside over a, a case like that, where in my view there was such uh, incredible overreaching by the powers that be uh, upon uh, citizens of our country. We don't have much time left, Judge Sam, and I, I do want to <coughs> talk to you about your family. Uh, oh, yes. you, you, you've talked a bit about your parents and about yes. your brothers and sisters. Yes. Uh, you were married for many years to your lovely wife, Betty. Oh, Betty Jean. <laughs> I hope I don't get overwhelmed by this. But she, she died one of the, can I get this plaque back here? Sure. Probably, you know, I have a lot of plaques around here that I don't deserve, you know, in recognition of something or another, <coughs> which I don't deserve, but I love this plaque. This was presented to me in memory of my beloved wife, Betty, who was a true lady of integrity by the Utah Peace Officers Association. And this author, uh, Derek uh, Hegstead, uh, the original painting of this print is his, is his work. And he wrote this little verse, <coughs> Journey's End, the storm you weathered faithfully stood I was beside you all the way, whispering you could. Well done, my faithful servant. For me, you defended. You stayed your course. Your journey has ended. And I was so touched when they presented that to me in honor of my wife. Uh, in fact, when we were in Romania in Little Bellu, the little peasant lady, she couldn't speak Romanian. They couldn't speak English. They, they held her and hugged her and said, please bring this, come back, please come back, bring your beautiful wife with you. And I said, yes, I will. And in fact, uh, in 1998, uh, around Christmas time, Dallin Oaks, <coughs> who I just have a great feel for professionally in our profession as we became acquainted, came to our home in Springville and uh, issued uh, preliminarily uh, foundation for a call by the LDS Church to be a mission president in, in Bucharest. And of course, I was so touched by that and my wife and, uh, and then uh, James Faust, President Faust, uh, issued the call to us in January. And of course, again, professionally, he's just another wonderful, wonderful man. And then we went through our physicals. She passed the preliminary physicals, and but had a little problem with one of her fingers, and we had to go to a, a hand specialist uh, for that. And, and checking that, uh, he said, uh, it's not a little problem, it's uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And Lou Gehrig's disease is such a terrible disease. It uh, eventually shuts down the body the mus muscular system. Of course, Lou Gehrig, I, when I was growing up, uh, of course, he, was, he died about the time, uh, you know, I was really getting involved in sports and all of that, but I've uh, read a lot about him. And your mind stays perfectly alert. <coughs> and I must say of all of whatever uh, and I, I might be recognized for, which I don't deserve, 
she is really uh, one of the great moving forces in my life and uh, she uh, didn't want anyone to care for her except me and uh, that was the greatest honor of my life even our beautiful daughters who would come and want to do things for her and so I just shut down everything my colleagues were wonderful they they wanted me to stay on as chief judge I was chief judge at the time to, to finish my course and I would come to Salt Lake for a few hours but on the, I could hardly wait to get home because I just couldn't bear to be away from her and uh, got to where she couldn't talk and she couldn't use her hands but she could speak with her eyes and I I, I don't know these are kind of tender things I don't know that maybe we need to talk about this too much but I remember I'd say I love you Betty I love you honey do you still love me? She'd move her little eyebrow. And then I'd say, but I love you more. And she'd go, no. <laughs> and so that was the great honor of my life. We, we couldn't go to Romania because of that. I had to write to President Faust a letter telling him of that. And then we were honorably excused. But uh, she, uh, we had six natural children. And then we adopted two from Guatemala. We weren't looking for any more children, but they were homeless. and. And uh, she was kind of the moving force behind that, too. I always argued that, you know, uh, this is going to be quite a burden. Uh, we made the other children me. And uh, the more I argued, uh, the, the other side, she uh, and the children kind of got upset with me. And uh, <laughs> so we adopted two more. Mm -hmm. And they've become beautiful children. Their pictures are back here. Oh, that's wonderful. Since uh, Betty's death, you've you've continued your service as a district court judge. Yes, as a senior judge. As a senior judge, and then you are one of those very lucky people who who got married again. Yes, and I I had Tell determined that. after that experience that I would never marry again, and uh, I became a recluse socially. I except with my children, and I. I just, uh, you know, they, they invited me to go on trips with them to Florida, to Cancun, to, you know, and I, I just lost myself and my family and, and my work here. And I, I just, and I was invited to meet various people that were just wonderful people that, to meet, uh, you know, socially, but I, I just declined to do that. And I, and then uh, I received a call, I, well it was about four, over four years I was a widower uh, on September the 27th from a, a lady that I knew uh, 33 years ago. And that call, uh, it was just one of those things that I, I don't know, it just uh, kind of like a, again a little miracle that turned into a little bit of a telephone uh, type exchange and into a telephone romance and uh, and uh, we we were married on January the 5th <laughs> and uh, she has four uh, grown children and nine grandchildren I have uh, 37 grand or 38 grandchildren 39 and 40 on the way and so between us we have uh, 49 grandchildren or soon will have 49 and 12 children so we went to buy cards. You know, they say it's cheaper by the dozen for birthdays <laughs> and all, but I can say it's not cheaper by the dozen. <laughs> yeah, right. But she is a lovely lady. Her name is Benny Lynn, B-E-N-N-I-E. -E, and her f she's named after her father, Benjamin Gideon Rolfe. And her father was a B-17 pilot in World War II, and her mom and dad were married only six months, I think, when he was sent to England. And on his 28th mission, I believe it was his 28th mission, November the 26th, 1944, late night mission over Hamburg, uh, again Hamburg, Germany, the incendiary bombings that you may on PBS uh, uh, that they bombed uh, Hamburg to, to just rubble. And uh, his B-17 was hit by German anti-aircraft fire. They believe that he probably went down on the 27th, which was his birthday. Isn't that ironic? 
and uh, he ordered the crew to bail out. Her mom got this information from the 8th Air Force after the war. Six of the nine bailed out. The co-pilot and bombardier refused to leave him, and they crashed into the Zyder Z. And the following spring, a Dutch fisherman found the three bodies, turned them over to a Dutch minister, and this kind minister uh, buried, uh, conducted a funeral for these three airmen who they did not know and buried them in uh, the church cemetery. They did have their dog tags. And after the war, uh, their bodies were moved to a military cemetery in Belgium, and then her father's uh, body was moved to Wasatch Lawn Memorial Gardens here on 33rd South and about 15th East, and she took me to his grave on December the 30th. And, and uh, her mom, in honor, she was born four and a half months later after he was shot down. And her mom, in honor of her father, named her Benny, B-E-N-N, -N, Lynn. And uh, they, were, uh, they were going to name her Benita Gay because Benjamin Gideon, B-G, Rolf, they were going to name her Benita Gay, but one of her grandmothers uh, said, oh, please don't do that. They were call her Ben Gay. <laughs> 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 so, but I have a picture of her, too. But, uh, um. <coughs> so you now still live in Springville? Springville, yes. And you, you told me just earlier today that you have a condominium here in Salt Lake. Yes, yeah. I've been wanting for a number of years. Uh, in fact, my wife, Betty Jean, and I talked about getting an apartment up here because the freeway mm -hmm. just has gotten terrible. And sometimes if I don't leave early, I like to get to Chambers early, as some of you know, like Judge Winder. He's a great example for me. And I just love Judge Winder. But anyway... Uh, you know, I like to get to chamber 6.30, quarter to 7, and miss that early traffic and then leave a little early and miss that later traffic because if I get caught in that 4.30, 5.30 traffic, sometimes it's an hour and a half, sometimes two to get home. And so we have an apartment at Brigham Apartments, and uh, when I'm up here on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we come up and stay three nights and then go home for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And if I'm in trial, of course, I'm here. And I just finished the Safeway trial not long ago, and that lasted all month, the month of uh, March. So we, but we didn't have the apartment finished or furnished then. So, but anyway, what a wonderful thing to. That's great. Come. to take uh, the last few minutes we have here of just uh, kind of walking around your, your chambers oh, and if you'd sure. show us oh, sure. some of the things that mean most, uh, most to most you. Most to me? Oh, sure. And my son Daryl, uh, he had that, uh, and my daughter-in-law, Andrea, uh, had that framed for me and presented that to me. Uh, I believe it was my birthday. It's, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And I, I just feel that that's a, a great standard to try to uh, live up to, and I, I hope in some small way I, I've done that or tried to do that. So you have. And that's a, a little piece of carpet from my courtroom downstairs that I occupied for uh, quite a number of years before I became the, uh, the senior judge. And one of the U.S. probation officers, uh, Steve Kelly, loved that carpet so much that he, when they <coughs> moved me up here and Judge Stewart moved downstairs and they redecorated his area, they tore that all out. And he asked the uh, people if he could have a piece of that carpet. And he had it framed. And he had it for a year or two. And he came in one day and said, Judge, I've had this framed because I love that carpet so much. And he said, I think you should have it as a memento, a token of remembrance of that carpet downstairs. I see you've got some oh, Olympic yes. pins. Yeah, the Olympic pins. I, I think it was the U.S. Marshals that brought these all in to me. They wanted me to have an array of a memory of the, of the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot of those. Let's and then my gavels. I have so many gavels. This one here is made of olive wood, and I guess you can guess where that came from. This came from Israel. One of my dear friends uh, was over there on assignment and, uh, and got this Mont Nyman. Uh, he was uh, over there 
and got me this uh, gavel made out of olive wood. This gavel here is uh, kind of interesting. You might guess where that's from. That's uh, from the islands of the Pacific. One of our dear friends uh, is a Maori and, uh, and gave me this uh, hmm. Maori gavel from uh, New Zealand. The Vaterini trial was uh, the one where in Zions Park where a husband allegedly pushed his uh, wife off of a cliff uh, in Zions Park to collect uh, 1.25 million dollars either in trust funds or insurance funds and that was a great trial. That was one of the few cases where we took the jury uh, to tour the site. We don't uh, often take juries out to view sites because uh, things can be adequately explained in the courtroom and particularly with the high-tech uh, things that we have. But that was one case where uh, both the prosecution, uh, uh, the U.S. attorney, uh, and the defense counsel thought it would be well if they did walk the trail. So we took the jury, and that's my court staff. And uh, it was a great experience and a great trial, by the way, that ended up in a not guilty verdict. This here painting is from a lady from Bosnia who's one of our... Uh, caretakers of our building, Azra is her name, and in fact, I think her name's right here, A-Z-R-A. She loved my chamber so much, she came in one day and said that she painted this of Salt Lake City and she wanted me to have it. <laughs> I was so touched by that, I, I had that uh, here in my chambers. Let's, let's and look. then this, this up ahead. here is the commission from, from President Reagan. This is Senator Hatch's speech on the Senate floor in these two paragraphs mentioned my father's uh, journey across Europe and then this is the confirmation vote by the United States Senate and this mentions of course we're uh, pursuant to the wording of the Constitution that we're appointed for life uh, subject to our good behavior. Now right below the great seal is a beehive. Yeah there's one of my uh, my daughter uh, my children get me little mementos and of my <laughs> hobby my daughter Tammy got me that straw skep, uh, and, uh, and of course one of the great encyclopedias on beekeeping uh, by the Dayton uh, Company, uh, which is one of the oldest beekeeping companies uh, the hive in the, the, the hive and the honeybee. I of course have had this uh, for years and years and years, in fact in our home we have a smaller print, but uh, he, uh, this was a copyright case uh, and he appeared uh, as a witness where he uh, so brought a, Arnold, Freeberg. Arnold Freeberg brought an action uh, for copyright infringement by uh, someone who had sculpted this uh, this uh, painting uh, without his permission and uh, and he uh, appeared in the witness chair he was in his 80s with tears coming out of his eyes telling why he did this because it was in the uh, around the bicentennial time of uh, 76 in that range just before that and there was some campus demonstrations and I think he was down at uh, Arizona State and students were demonstrating uh, and he just felt so bad that they didn't understand uh, the, the, this great country and the history and the foundation. He went to his room and started to sketch a, a picture of what in his mind it meant to, to be an American and he, he went back to Washington he said and to the Smithsonian and he held his sword in his hand. He, put his cape on his shoulders. He went to Valley Forge and their pitiful condition that the Continental Army was in, uh, he wanted to show where the power came from for this great father of our country. Mm -hmm. So this is the glass hive. And, and as I was telling you, the nationalities of bees, this is, uh, these are Carnolians. They come from uh, the area of uh, Egypt in that uh, area, Turkey and Egypt. I saw the queen this morning. She's a young new queen and she's not quite as large as uh, as when they are in a bigger hive. And Well, Judge Sam, uh, I've had this tour before. Because I, the, the, our audience needs to know that you, 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 in your courtesy to lawyers, frequently give tours of your, of your chambers. Uh, but it's been a pleasure to conduct this one with you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you for the last couple of hours, and thank you very much. Oh, Alan, what a, what a pleasure to be with you, and please know my, my affection and my respect for the great uh, example you are to our great...